Good morning, Saltbox. I'm Michael Mattis, and uh, I pastor a church, if you're tuning in from another place, in Wilmington, North Carolina, called Saltbox Church, and I want to welcome you. Um, we are actually starting a new collection of talks uh, called Beautiful Attitudes, and uh, we've called it Beautiful Attitudes because a number of years ago, um, Billy Graham was actually speaking, and he called the Beatitudes the eight beautiful attitudes that God has called each of us to have. So uh, Clive did an amazing job last week, um, beginning uh, this sort of passage in Matthew 5, and he also did this great job of sort of opening the door to where it actually happened. This natural stone amphitheater on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, a place called Aramis Heights. And so here we have Jesus. And I guess before we totally jump into this, a couple of things I want to set the table with. Um, spiritual gifts. A lot of people have talked about those. But, but in, in spiritual gifts, when the Apostle Paul writes in the New Testament about those, Many of us have one or more spiritual gifts, but none of us have all of the spiritual gifts, right? Now, when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, um, I think that's Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, you begin to get this idea that all of us as believers are called, as we surrender our life to King Jesus, as he lives his life in us and through us, to take on the fruit of the Spirit, as we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that we're all called to walk in those fruits, so similarly, uh, with the Beatitudes or the beautiful attitudes, there are eight sort of character um, qualities that I don't think we can manufacture on our own. So it's not works righteousness or performance Christianity. No, no. It's actually coming and saying, Lord Jesus, in myself, I am bankrupt. I can't do it. Um, I surrender all and letting him fill you. And then walking out these beautiful attitudes or these eight character quality. So what's a little bit intimidating uh, for me is that as we read these, each of us as believers is called um, uh, to embrace and to walk in not one or two or three, but all eight. So, you know, it's funny in my own life, um, if I'm ever feeling sort of um, proud or arrogant or like I'm doing pretty well or even just sort of pleased with myself. And, you know, all I have to do is flip over and read the Beatitudes or um, read even 1 Corinthians 13, kind of the laws of love or the fruit of the Spirit. And, and immediately what happens inside of me is it's like, oh my goodness, Lord Jesus, it brings me back to this place of sort of contrition and humility where I go, oh, I'm not yet there. So I want to invite you sort of into this journey. We're going to look at these um, beatitudes, and, and I think it's actually strategic because we're looking at these character qualities or these beautiful attitudes at a time when I feel like they're not being lived out well or exemplified well by the church at large. So it is sort of a, okay, let's refocus, let's shift our gaze, let's look back and go, what is Jesus actually saying here? Now, a little, little broader perspective on the entire Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon on the Mount um, is, is a message that Jesus gave probably over a number of days. And it, it is probably, it is the greatest sermon of all time. It is, it's like this, um, it is the essence sort of of a New Testament, Christ-centered Christianity. And we, we did this graphic here behind me. It's kind of interesting, but you see you've got one tree uh, that sticks out amongst the, the whole forest. And the reason we did that is because um, in, in Greek, holy means hagios. And, and hagios, um, it literally means set apart. It, it means different. And the Sermon on the Mount is like this original uh, sort of countercultural, against the grain thing that Jesus did. And there's many New Testament believers or believers today that would probably say something like, well, when Jesus came, you know, he got rid of all the Old Testament law. And I would say, well, that's probably a version of the truth. I'd probably actually go, he came and he fulfilled it. But what Jesus does in this Sermon on the Mount is he actually takes the standard of Christian life and he raises the standard so high that now it's not just hard, it's like absolutely impossible and it brings us to this surrendered place before God where we go, oh my goodness, I can't do it. So, you know, literally we have a call to stand out, a call to be different, a call to be set apart in our culture. And if there's a downfall that I want to sort of address as we weave and read through these eight 
uh, character qualities, it, it is that we as American Christians seem to try so hard to make our culture Christian. And I think the call that you actually begin to see in the Sermon on the Mount, you begin to see it in the Beatitudes, you can see it illustrated in our little picture, but the call is to acknowledge that our culture is not Christian. Uh, the call is to acknowledge that Jesus is not the center of our country or um, our states or our whole constitution. No, he is not. And therefore, uh, we are called as ambassadors carrying Christ Jesus to go and to change our culture with the power of the gospel. But the problem is when we as believers tr keep trying to make our culture Christian, um, it, 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 we no longer, it's sort of like we're rendered void and we're powerless then to actually be filled with the spirit and go in to take what is broken and begin to make it right by the power of the gospel. So that's really what, what we as Christians are called to do is be different, is stand out, is be, be totally separate. And so Jesus sets forth in this Sermon on the Mount and it's like everything cuts against the grain, everything. So he starts here and... You know, he's really answering the question in these Beatitudes. Um, he's asking who uh, is best off or, or who is most happy in this life. And it's, it's almost, you could say, a biblical recipe for happiness. And you might go, Michael, that's, a, that's not a very biblical word. And I'd sort of agree with you because the biblical state is to be filled with joy. It's the joy of the Spirit. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And that's different than happiness. But when you look at this Greek word that we're about to read, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's what all the um, Beatitudes start with, blessed. That, that Greek word is um, markarios, and it literally means uh, happy. So I want you to sort of grasp this as we read it, and this is why I'm telling it to you first. So a better translation of blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is uh, happy the position of the poor in spirit. So Jesus is almost giving us sort of a prescription or a, listen, if you can get your heart and life surrendered to this point, if you can bring yourself um, to this place where you're poor in spirit, and we're going to have to ask, what is poor in spirit? What does that mean? But if you can get to this um, place, it is going to produce something inside of you where you get or you access the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but what I want in my life more than anything, like you know, take it all, but I want the gracious hand of God to rest on my life. I want the peace of Christ to emanate in our home, in our marriage, with our kids. I, I, I want the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven to be present, not only inside of me, but emanating out from me so that everywhere I go and every interaction I have is literally uh, salt and light. And I think that's sort of the call that we're looking at here. So it's, it's almost like these are declarative statements. You're going to be uh, most happy, most fulfilled if you are poor in spirit. So uh, let me also say this, in, in the West, in America, happiness is often defined um, by either what we have or what we don't have, right? Uh, you could also flip that and go, it is also at times defined by um, who we are or our position or how known we are, or if you're younger, maybe how many followers you have on a social media account. But, but it's literally, it's, it's your happiness or your fulfilledness in life is somehow impacted by even the way you think people perceive you. So what Jesus is dealing with here is where is a true fulfillment, where is true um, happiness. And what he's basically saying is it's going to stem and it's going to come from your internal character and your heart. And if you try um, to get this sort of contentment, peace, or happiness from the outside in, you're going to fail miserably. So he's like, no, no, let's start with the heart. So the Sermon on the Mount always deals, the entire thing always deals with character and what's inside before it touches sort of conduct and what's outside. Happy the position of the poor in spirit. So, you know, the world that you and I live in um, at face value might be the cars we drive or the homes we stay in or the apartments or the family we have or the roommates we have or the hobbies we have or the occupations, all that stuff. But truthfully, 
if we, if we sort of um, peeled all that away, where we actually live is the internal state in our heart. In other words, there have been times where everything in my life seems perfect and beautiful, nothing's wrong, and yet my internal state, for whatever reason, is negative, and guess what I am? Negative. Now flip that around. There's also been times where it seems like everything in my world is falling apart, everything looks bad, everything looks difficult, and yet my internal state is one that is turned towards the Lord Jesus, and therefore it is ordered, and um, I am poor in spirit and full of his peace, full of his joy. So Jesus is literally getting at what is your internal state in these eight Beatitudes, and we're about to read just the first one. But Jesus is addressing the world in which you and I live each day, and no one really knows that but you and the God that created you, even your best friend, even a spouse, they're not, they can't fully get inside what is going on in your heart. And that's the power. That is what Jesus is talking about in these verses. So I'm going to read Matthew 5, and I'm going to just go 1 through 3, very short passage. And we're going to focus everything today on being poor in spirit. What does that mean? How do we access that? How do we do that? How do we become that? And in order to understand that, we're going to look at um, the Jesus posture, we're going to look at the Jesus pattern, and we're going to look at the Jesus principle. And all three of those point to having and accessing the kingdom of God in your life on a daily basis. So let's read Matthew 5, verses 1 through 3. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Holy Spirit, would you illuminate this passage for us today? Would you change us? Would you fill us? In your name we pray, amen. So the first thing that I actually want to point out to you this morning is the Jesus posture. So when we think of the word posture, uh, we, we often think of um, our, the way we sit, the way we stand, the way we hold ourselves. And I want you to take a look here at the Jesus posture. So Jesus literally um, goes up onto a mountain. Luke says he comes down, but either way, he goes to this sort of flat place in the mountain. And the next thing he does is, is absolutely um, fascinating uh, because he actually sits down. Now, what's really interesting is he, he, uh, he, he takes a seat, and it's uh, fascinating to me because in America um, and in the West, the hush falls over the crowd when somebody stands up. But in this Hebrew culture, the hush would fall over the crowd when a rabbi would sit down. And so this, this posture that Jesus immediately takes, it's, it's literally a posture where he is sitting before um, God. And when a rabbi would sit, what it would indicate is, listen, this is important. I am now speaking the words of Yahweh. I am speaking God's word. These are not my words. And so I'm going to symbolically sit down so that Yahweh, that God, that King Jesus, as it were, would be elevated. And you know, we don't know uh, exactly what happened as Jesus sat. I've been to the place where I think he sat. It's an amazing spot. And it's almost like this is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. So you have in the Old Testament where uh, Moses uh, literally goes up to Mount Sinai and he gets the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant. And Jesus, by going up into this mountain, by sitting down, he is literally saying, I'm the new Moses. This is the new covenant. That is where the New Testament is literally born, is in this, in this very moment. And, you know, it doesn't say anything um, about whether or not he took off his sandals, but I imagine that he might have taken off his, his sandals and sat there, and he literally begins to teach them. And so what you actually get is this imagery that Jesus, God Almighty, has gone up into the mountain, and he has now sat down, and he is literally going, where we are now sitting is holy ground. Where we are sitting is set apart by God, and we, as a people, I am now gonna teach and share with you the essence the fulfillment of the Old 
Testament covenant. So the first thing that you literally begin to see here with King Jesus is he sits contrary to everything else. In America, we're sort of taught to stand up straight, to lift our chest, to lift our chin, to look forward, to look people in the eye, to uh, uh, almost self-aggrandize, to make ourselves bigger, to make ourselves look better. The entire premise of social media right now is that we take a picture and we crop it and we edit it and we get the stuff out we don't like and we blush out the little zit on our forehead and then we post this like perfect, beautiful thing. And not so with Jesus. He literally goes up and he makes himself less by sitting down. He, he uh, humbles himself before God. And so literally when Jesus sits down, I imagine that everyone sort of goes, ah, and holds their breath, waiting for the rabbi, the master, to speak. Jesus is the new Moses. This sitting down is interesting too because it literally, in Latin, it's ex cathedra. It literally means uh, not from the cathedral, not from the building, not from a grand city or a place. No, no, it means from a seated position. It means um, from the seat, from the chair. And what it literally means is uh, it is the chair of authority, sort of the seat of authority. So what Jesus says here carries. It carries all authority under heaven and on earth. Earth. You know, we have a um, dear friend who is a judge, and he's told me a number of stories, but one of the stories he's told me is he was presiding in his courtroom at some point, and he's sitting at his bench, and I think he had his gavel and probably his computer and his notes, and a person came in, I think they were a younger person, and um, you know, a judge next to them has a bailiff. And the bailiff, if you've ever been in a courtroom, is usually standing there, something like this, and there's usually a gun, and there's usually a set of handcuffs, and they're in uniform. So uh, symbolically, you have the judge who, who has the authority in the room, and then uh, at his um, sort of disposal is this bailiff who has the power, right? This gun on his hip. And my friend told me this story where a young person came in and the young person is just land blasting them, cussing and yelling and F-bombing and expletives and ugliness and ugliness. And he just sat there, just calm, quiet. And he let the person go on and on and on. And he said nothing. The bailiff is standing right here, hand on his gun, other hand on his handcuffs. And the judge waited. And when the person finally stopped, he looked at him and said, are you done? Now the judge has all the authority in the room. He has all the authority really in the city, in the, in the, um, even the county, and he could immediately look at the bailiff and say, bailiff, take this person and throw him in a holding cell for 24 hours and we'll revisit this tomorrow, right? He's got all authority and he has power at his disposal. And yet he just sits and he waits because he's not threatened, because he's confident in his robe, if you will, or chair of power. He's confident in his authority. And when the person's done, he looks and says, are you finished? And I think the young person was blown away. And then he spoke. But that's the same idea that you have here with Jesus is literally Jesus comes to earth and he's carrying, he's fully God, he's fully man. He is carrying all authority. He is carrying all power. And so he doesn't have to get on a big microphone or put himself out on social media or try to draw a big crowd. No, no, he goes up for the most important sermon of all time, the best sermon of all time, the sermon that would wreck all other sermons, the sermon that would fulfill the Old Testament law, the sermon that would define the New Testament church, We still live by it. It governs us today. It is the very word of God. And instead of um, puffing himself up, he takes the posture of sitting down. The Jesus posture, my first point, is that he sits. You know, I think of you and I, and if you're like me, uh, at points you probably have disagreements with people. And if you have disagreements at points, you might even um, have a raised voice. And you know what's funny is I actually began to think of this and I thought, the next time I'm in some disagreement and I'm tempted to raise my voice, I think I'm gonna sit down and I'm just gonna take my shoes off. 
Because what it does is it produces this um, poverty in spirit. It, it actually uh, communicates externally that I'm not here to be right. I'm not here to crush you. I'm not here to obliterate you. And, and sadly, I've seen so too many Christians, sadly, I, I myself have gotten in these disagreements where the goal doesn't become connection and relationship, but the goal becomes being right. And so we have King Jesus literally sitting on a hillside in this funny little country called Israel in the Middle East, and he literally sits down because he knows who he is. See, when we're poor in spirit before God, and the, and the first thing he says is, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he's illustrating it by his very posture. He's illustrating it by sitting down. And then he goes on and says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So for us, poor in spirit, literally as we stand before God means, uh, God, this is your life. This is your house. This is your family. This is your finances. Everything I have is yours. That, that illustrates poverty of spirit. But take a person like that and get them in a disagreement. And the moment you bow up, the moment you try to establish your own rightness, the moment you get on Facebook and go, I can't believe they said that. I'm going to say, you are literally demonstrating that you are not poor in spirit. And if you're not poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is not yours. Poverty of spirit. You know, if you look at people and if you show me a person who can authentically come to God and go, God, I was wrong, would you forgive me? And then if you show me this person who can take that a step further and, and love their neighbor really as themselves by looking at someone and going, I was wrong to a friend or a neighbor or someone they've hurt, would you forgive me? I'll show you a person who's developing poverty in spirit. This has nothing to do with money. This has to do with an internal attitude. Now, similarly, you show me a person who is unable to stand before God and go, Lord, I was wrong, would you forgive me? You show me a person who um, is too arrogant and sort of self-focused that they're unable to look at someone else in the eye and go, would you forgive me, I was wrong? I'll show you a person who is not poor in spirit. I'm not talking about whether you're saved at this moment. I've seen many, many Christians who fail to walk in poverty of spirit, who fail to walk in his kingdom. And I don't know about you, but the thing that I hunger for and thirst for more than anything else is to be not only full of his spirit, but to walk in his kingdom, his will, and his way. And Jesus says the way you walk, the ingredient, the path to the kingdom of heaven being yours is being poor in spirit. You know, I began to look at my own life on this same thing. And I actually began to see how many times when someone has come to me and pointed out something that was wrong or something that I did or maybe a way that I hurt them, I, I always go, oh, yeah, well, okay, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? But, and then I throw this but in there. But you, blah, 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 and then I fill in the blank, right? I think that's another way that we as Christians, when we, when we throw that um, sort of that B-U-T out there, that but, at some level, we're not embracing poverty of spirit. And therefore, we're not embodying and we're not accessing all of the kingdom of God that he would have for us. Charles Spurgeon, one of my heroes, says, the way to rise in the kingdom of God is to sink ourselves. The way you rise is actually when you sink yourself. Another person I read said, you're never more like Jesus than when you humble yourself and you're never more like Satan than when you exalt yourself. You know, it's interesting to look at as we look at the Jesus posture, think about the people that access the kingdom of God in his day. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So who accessed the kingdom of heaven in Jesus's day? Was it the rich people? A few, but not many. Maybe Joseph, Arimathea. Was it the uh, religious people? Almost across the board, no. 
Was it the, um, now would be modern pastors, Pharisees, Sadducees? No, almost across the board, no. Who accessed the kingdom of God in Jesus' day is those who were able to come and go, I am morally bankrupt, I am broken, I am destitute, I am hopeless. And it was often the prostitutes, it was often tax collectors who were stealing from people, and it was fishermen who actually accessed the kingdom of God. Church, I think we'll be absolutely startled when we get to heaven and look back at who populates heaven and who doesn't. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Christian life is actually not about being right. It's really not even about doing right. It's actually about acknowledging that apart from Jesus, apart from the cross, we can't be right or do right. It's about surrendering all before him. You know, I've got a book that a a guy that I respect by the name of Billy Graham signed. And next to his signature, he has John 3.30. Literally, John 3.30 says, he must become greater and I must become less. Take a seat. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you want to access the kingdom of heaven in your life, Become poor in spirit. If you want to access the kingdom of heaven in your home, begin to close your mouth and listen. Maybe ask for forgiveness. Become poor in spirit. You know, I'm convinced that the faster I can become wrong, the faster I can acknowledge that I don't have it all together, the faster the finished work of the cross is activated in my life and in my circumstances and in my relationships. I've actually been accused before of asking forgiveness too quickly. And I go, okay, maybe, maybe I could grow there. But here's the thing. When we as a people acknowledge that we're, we're wrong, that we, that we don't have all the answers, that we don't have it all figured out, the finished work of the cross, the resurrection power of King Jesus can then be activated in and through our lives. You, you, you've got to get wrong. You've got to become poor in spirit so that you can be made right before a holy God. So the first thing here is the Jesus posture. In fact, Ephesians 2, 6 talks about us being seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms. So Jesus goes up to preach the greatest sermon of all time and he sits down. My second point this morning is the Jesus pattern. Jesus illustrated someone who was poor in spirit. And let me give it to you like this. Uh, On the, the last week of Jesus's life, he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem is what it said. And he went first to the Mount of Olives in obedience, set his face like flint. Flint's like an old school thing you use to start a fire, but it's real sharp and pointed. So Jesus set his face like flint. He goes to the Mount of Olives in obedience. Then from the Mount of Olives, he crosses into the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus settles once and for all, is it gonna be my will or is it gonna be God's will? Is it gonna be my way or is it gonna be God's way? And then from the Garden of Gethsemane, In another day or two, he goes to Calvary or Golgotha, the place of the skull where he was crucified, and he lays it all down. And after a couple of days, he raises and breaks the bonds of hell, breaks the bonds of death, breaks the yoke of the sin of slavery. He breaks the ground open and he rises from the dead at the garden tomb. Now listen to me, this is the Jesus pattern There's many, many Christians, there's even many pastors, there's many teachers who who wanna tell you that you can sort of go from the Mount of Olives right to the garden tomb, right to resurrection. You can access all the good stuff. You can be a son and a daughter and an heir and you can walk with him. And, And that's true in a manner of speaking. But the Jesus pattern literally says you've got to set your face like flint to obey him. You've got to pass through the garden of Gethsemane where you settle, not just today, but every day. Is it his will or is it my will? Is it his way or is it my way? And then you've got to pass through Golgotha, the place of the skull, death. Whose death? Jesus's death. Whose death? My death. Your death. See, the Christian life begins when you acknowledge that Jesus died for you, but the Christian life continues when you recognize that you've been called to die with him. 
And then and only then can you cross over and experience the full resurrection power of Christ Jesus in every aspect of your life. Can you fully understand what it means to be a son or a daughter of the king? Can you be entrusted with the authority of heaven? Can you be entrusted to walk this thing out and entrusted with the power to change a piece of your world? for the gospel of Christ Jesus. See, the Jesus pattern takes you through over the Mount of Olives, through Gethsemane, the place of decision, through Golgotha, where you die with him to the resurrection place. That is the Jesus pattern. It illustrates someone who is poor in spirit, someone who is fully yielded to God. So firstly, we have this Jesus posture where our King, our Jesus, our Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, he created the very hill that he's sitting on, comes and he sits, he rests, and he teaches from a place of sitting, a place of rest. And then the second thing we have is this Jesus pattern where he illustrates what it means to be poor in spirit. And the third thing we have is the Jesus principle Now, Jesus was not his own. If you're in Jesus, you are no longer your own, and I am no longer my own. I've been bought with a price, the price of the blood of Jesus. You've been bought with a price. That means you don't have your own life anymore, and I don't have my own life anymore. It means you don't have any rights anymore. And it means I don't have any rights anymore. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, do you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Listen for it. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. See, I have been purchased. It, it means one more, those of us who are in Jesus, we are called and expected biblically to have yielded lives, to have surrendered lives, to um, obey him. You know, Jesus actually said at one place, I think it's John 5, he says, in fact, I have it here, John 5, verses 19, Jesus answered them and he says, I tell you, the son, him, Jesus, can do nothing by himself, only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. See, the Jesus way is the way of surrender. The Jesus principle means I die to my own way and I take up his way. Jesus illustrated it. The Jesus way means I give up my rights. It's all his. You know, here in this great country of America that I love, we have a declaration of independence we have a constitution, we have a bill of rights. And I'd actually say, as I've read and studied the countries and nations of the world, the American experiment is a beautiful one. It's a brilliant one. It's been an unusual and amazing journey. And I would actually say that uh, there is a Judeo and was a Judeo-Christian worldview that influenced the founding fathers who wrote those documents and who established Um, America. There's no other faith. There's no other worldview. There's no other perspective. There's no other persuasion that, that would give you individual rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But that doesn't make America Christian. Now listen to me for just a second. America was founded on Judeo Christian values, but that doesn't make her Christian. That's the biblical mandate for how we treat other people, do unto others as we would have them do unto us. It also means that we would have to acknowledge that the founding fathers made some major blunders. They made some blunders on slavery, specifically the African-American group in America. They made some blunders on the American Indians. They made some blunders as time went on on Japanese and Chinese Americans. They made some blunders on women, not giving them the right to vote and full equality under the law. The founding fathers had a lot right, but let's not live in delusion that we live in a Christian nation. We don't. See, American evangelicals, in my opinion, have gotten so far into my rights that in my humble estimation, we are now missing the larger picture that for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we have no rights. It's all him. It's all King Jesus. 
And if we're in him, he's in us. He died for us, we died with him. He now lives his life in us and through us. And when he says go, I go. When he says stay, I stay. And when he says move, I move. It is him. My right is now to follow my King Jesus. I want the presence of Jesus in my life more than anything. I assume if you're hanging around Saltbox and you listen to me for more than a week or two, you have some hunger and thirst inside of you for the presence of Jesus too. I want the fingerprint of God in my life. I want the gracious hand of God more than anything to be in me and over me. I want the kingdom of heaven to be activated in everything that we do, in our church, in our family, in every other aspect. I want to become poor in spirit so the kingdom of God is fully activated in our life, in our church, in our home, and in our midst. Here's the stark truth, church, and hear me, hear me. You have as much of the kingdom of God in your life today as you want. You are as poor in spirit today as you want to be. So here's my question. And Stacy, if you'll come up and get ready for the, just help me by playing maybe. But here's my question for you on this Sunday morning. Are you living the Jesus posture? Are you humble? Are you poor in spirit? Are you sitting down or are you self aggrandizing? Are you inflating? Have you embraced the Jesus posture? Have you embraced the Jesus pattern, knowing that you have to settle, whether it's going to be your will or his will? Have you embraced the call to come and die with him? And are you living your life in the Jesus principle that you have no rights, that your life is not your own? You may be tuned in this morning, and Stacy, you can go ahead and play for us if you don't mind. But you may be tuned in or on a podcast or watching on Facebook or some other platform. And you may go, Michael, I've never surrendered my life to King Jesus. I've never given my heart to him. I don't know how to access the kingdom of God. I don't even know how to be poor in spirit. And I would actually invite you, it's simple. It's a supernatural transaction but you surrender your life to him. You give it all to him. You you, you lay it all down and you say, Lord, it's yours. Would you forgive me? Would you heal me? Would you renew me? Would you make me new? If you're there, if you're watching, if you're listening, no matter where you are, pray with me. You don't have to pray these exact words, but let these words reflect the attitude of your heart. Lord Jesus, I recognize that you are God, that you walk the earth, that you died for my sin. I recognize that you rose from the dead. I recognize that you were crucified dead and buried, but you beat death, you beat hell. You rose. I recognize that you are Lord, creator of heaven and earth. And I ask that you would come into my heart, that you would forgive me, that you would fill me, that you would cleanse me, that you would make me new. Lord, would you help me walk out with you in a daily way, the Jesus posture, the Jesus pattern, and the Jesus principle. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. As Stacy closes with this song, if you're a believer, I want you to take a minute and let the Holy Spirit sift your heart, sift your life. Let him shine a light on you and ask, are you living the Jesus posture? Are you living the Jesus pattern? Are you living the Jesus principle? Or is there an area, or maybe there's multiple areas that you need to come to him and say, Lord, would you take this? Would you cleanse this area? And would you make me new?